Matthew chapter 5 is our scripture reading. Matthew 5. We're going to start reading at verse 17. And this is challenging stuff. This is Jesus showing to those in his first audience and showing to us what goodness, what righteousness really looks like. And for a lot of us, this is a stretch. Do not think, Jesus says, that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven." You have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, is answerable to the court. That's a term of, it's in Aramaic, it's a term of uh, disgust at who they are and what they're doing. Anyone who says to the brother or sister, raka, is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come, offer your gift. Settle settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Dearly loved people of God, I read the Ten Commandments this morning. Don't always do it, like to do it from time to time. But sometimes reading through the Ten Commandments or hearing them, it sometimes makes righteousness sound somehow doable. The Ten Commandments say, you shall not murder. And we hear in our mind, "Ah, I haven't stabbed, have I stabbed anybody recently? You hear in the Ten Commandments how it says, you shall not commit adultery. And we hear and think in our minds a little bit, well, have I slept with anybody's spouse recently? We hear in the Ten Commandments, you shall not steal. And we hear in our mind, have you robbed a bank in the last week, the last month, decade? No? 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 Ah, then we're good, aren't we? We got this thing. We haven't done those horrible crimes. We've we got to be pretty, pretty well off then. And sometimes we're tempted into legalism that way. What's legalism? Legalism, as I looked it up in the dictionary, it's excessive adherence to the details of the law. It's getting overly t- 
tied up in the precise do's and don'ts of the law. Particularly in religion, legalism is an adherence to a moral law rather than personal religious faith. I suspect that legalism is a temptation for most people. It certainly is for me. The idea of having a checklist of do's and don'ts somehow sounds more doable than imitating Jesus' loving, life-giving lifestyle. And don't kid yourself, legalism was alive and well within the Jewish community of Jesus' day. Leaders with brilliant legal minds diligently studied the Ten Commandments and the other commandments found in the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. And they counted out how many commandments there were there. 613 they found. And these Pharisees and teachers of the law then tried to figure out exactly what it looked like to precisely obey each of those 613 commandments. And they were good at it. Uh, They have a bad reputation among Christians these days. If you were to point a finger at somebody and say, that person is a Pharisee, everybody would feel insulted and offended by being called something like that. But not in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were highly respected. And why was that? Well, because they had their roots in coming back out of exile. Back in the Old Testament. The people who lived in Jerusalem and Judea were taken captive to Babylonia, to Babylon. And there they were punished for 70 years of exile, being far from God, being far from the holy city, being far from the temple of God. They were cast out of God's house. And they longed to go back. And so finally, in the days of Cyrus, when they came back into the land, they said, now we're going to do it right. We're never going to be cast in exile again. We're going to obey God's law and honor him with everything we got. That's the root of Pharisees. And the teachers of the law saying, we're going to be right this time and never be cast out of the promised land ever again. They resolved they were going to obey God's law as rigorously as possible. So if that meant that they had to count how many steps they took on the Sabbath day so they didn't accidentally work by taking one too many steps, that's what they were going to do. They were going to hold God's name as holy. We're going to misuse it at all. So that meant as they're reading through the, the Bible as they had it in the day, and they came across the holy name of God, they weren't going to pronounce it. Just in case they said it wrong. They would say Adonai, which means Lord, rather than pronounce the name of God. It's something that Jewish scholars, Hebrew scholars do to this day. I was taught to do that when I learned Hebrew in seminary. They were determined to be holy. And they had a good reputation back in the day of people who were holy. Maybe a little bit tight, but, but they were good people trying to be good. And so when Jesus made his statement, everybody's jaw dropped. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That hissing sound you hear is everybody in the crowd slowly deflating. If they can't make it by their righteousness, then what hope in the world do I have of ever being holy and righteous enough to enter the kingdom of heaven? If those holy rollers don't cut it, then people like you, people like me, just have no hope. Why even try anymore? You see, Jesus takes God's law more seriously even than the Pharisees and teachers of the law did. He warns everyone who listens, do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. It kind of makes sense when you remember who Jesus is, doesn't it? According to his parents, he's the descendant of King David. 
But every Christmas season again, we're reminded that Jesus is also the Son of God. God the Father sent God the Son into the world to redeem it, to rescue it. And if Jesus is God, then he participated in the creation of the world. He was there when God called everything into being. If Jesus is God, then he participated in giving the law to Moses at Mount Sinai. If Jesus is God, then this is God, then this is Jesus' rule for holy living as much as it is, is God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. They're in complete unison, agreement that this is what holy living looks like. In fact, Jesus knows the intention, the purposes of each of these commands even more than the Pharisees and teachers of the law ever did. He understands the purposes, the reasons between, behind each of the 613 commands in the first five books of the Bible. So he's not about to be looking for loopholes. How can we get past this one? He's not going to look, like, look for shortcuts and say, well, that's kind of okay. It's fudging a little bit, but it's okay. That's not what Jesus is going to do. This is his rule for holy living. And he explores the intentions of the law in the sermon here on the mount. He reveals the benchmark for holy living is even higher than the Pharisees thought it was. It's even higher than we expected it. I mean, most people agree that it's possible to murder a person with a knife. You put it in the right place and twist it a little bit, they're dead. Jesus said it's also possible to murder a person with your words. I've done that. The first term, time I ever said the F word was in my parents' blue Chevy Malibu in the church parking lot at about 11.30 one Sunday morning when I was sitting in the car waiting for my parents to be done talking with their friends after church. And my sister got into the car beside me. I don't know what she did. Probably accused me of turning the car on. I probably did. But she made me so mad! She made me so angry that I found the most horrible, most deadly, most offensive word I could, and I threw that F-bomb at her. I killed my sister with my words that day. Can you relate? Have you ever cut anybody to pieces with your words? What about with your eyes? I mean, you've heard the expression before, if look could kill, I'd be dead right now. Have you ever stabbed anybody with a murderous glare? Is that murder? Or adultery? I've heard women describe what it looks like when a guy runs his eyes up and down her frame. If it's her husband, and it's lovingly done, she can glow in his appreciation. But if it's a random guy thinking dirty thoughts, it feels like she's been violated undressed, fondled with his eyes. He can protest innocence. I was just looking. But lust, even rape, is under his gaze. And this stuff's easy to fall into, isn't it? It's our sinful nature. After the fall, we can't escape sin and brokenness. It's beset all humankind. Even on our best days, we lapse into sin and brokenness. We don't measure up to the level of goodness required by the letter or by the spirit of God's law. And God is just. God is holy. He's not about to ignore sin, especially not adultery, not murder. The punishment for sin is always death, both physical death and an eternity of being damned and cut off from God's goodness and life. Our only hope is the rescuer of all humankind. Verse 17 points to that hope. It says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Jesus said, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
You see, Jesus is God the Son who came to fulfill all the righteous requirements of God's holy law. He is the one who is successful in living a good life, a blameless life, a holy life. Jesus actually practiced what he preached. He didn't murder with words. Jesus' words brought healing, restoration. When he told somebody who had leprosy, go and be clean, they were cleansed and healed and made whole once again. When he called people to wake up from the dead and eat something, they got up and ate and lived. Even when Jesus' words cut us deeply, it's like a nurse's needle or a surgeon's scalpel. This is going to hurt, but it'll also heal. You'll be healthier and stronger as a result. Because the heart of Jesus' mission is to heal. He came to rescue humankind. He came to fulfill the law. He fulfilled all righteousness. And by faith in Jesus, His righteousness gets attributed to you. See, this is the miraculous exchange that happens. At the cross, Jesus shouldered all humankind's sin and guilt and shame. He died the death that we deserved as our substitute. He took the place that we belong in. But when he was buried, Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. Death did not have the victory. No, on the third day, Jesus rose, and at his resurrection, all Jesus' disciples, those who have faith in him as Lord, as Redeemer, are raised to life. They're raised to righteousness. We're clothed in his holiness and his goodness, as if we had never sinned or been a sinner. You see, sin and death get defeated. Believers in Jesus are raised to life, raised to life, to hope. Is there anything that would hold you back from holding on to Jesus as Savior and Lord? I mean, what would prevent you from receiving this gift of life? This gift of Jesus' righteousness. He's the one that lived up to his word. He fulfilled the law and the prophets on behalf of sinful humankind. Jesus did what the rest of us could not do. And so we find the truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where it says, Since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. That's our hope. That's our confidence. In His death and resurrection, our guilt is removed. And you get made holy. But now that we've been rescued from sin and death, we can't go back to that poisonous way of life again. We've been set free from, love, from sin. Now God the Holy Spirit is at work within us, transforming us to be good, transforming us to be loving, transforming us to be life-giving the way that Jesus is. We're in the exact same place that God's chosen people were after they were rescued from slavery in Egypt. After God rescued them, God taught them how to live as His holy, dearly loved people. He gave them instructions on goodness as they sat camped around Mount Sinai. That's when God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit gave them the Ten Commandments through Moses and said, you want to live holy lives now? This is what it looks like. And today we hear those commands all over again as Jesus' instructions. How do you live? How do we live as God's holy and dearly loved people? And so Jesus says, well, if you're worshiping, and you recall that somebody has something against you, you're called to, to leave worship and go and be reconciled to them. Insofar as you're able to, we're called to make peace with our brothers and sisters, to seek reconciliation, to ask for forgiveness, to offer forgiveness, to make things right between us again. And that's a challenging thing to do. It kills us to ask someone for forgiveness. You might need to pray fervently for the Holy Spirit to go with you, to lend you strength and boldness as you make that kind of a phone call, that, that kind of a visit. 
And it might take a mediator, a supporter from some other person that you know and trust among the believers. But we're called to be reconciled with each other. And then there's another part of what Jesus said that's also really radical. Remember how Jesus said that? If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to throw, be thrown into hell. That's radical. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. I mean, Jesus' words cut us deeply. He uses strong imagery. But there's a guy I know. I got to know him through dog competitions. When he drinks red wine, it makes him aggressive. Aggressive with his words and with his fists. The only time I've ever had to break up a bar fight was when I was at a restaurant with this guy. And he was drinking red wine. And as an outsider, the solution seems really obvious. Come on, buddy, stop drinking red wine. Stop drinking alcohol at all. If that's what makes you aggressive, if that's what makes you murderous, if that's what makes you abusive, stop drinking it. But he enjoyed red wine. He loved drinking beer. To suggest that he give it up would sound as radical to him as if you told him he had to pluck out his eye and throw it away. How is he going to live without beer? The same thing with computers or tablets or smartphones. Oh, we need them for work. I know, I know. We need them for communication. And for some, it feels like we can't live without this device. But if the games, if the images, if the scenes that play on the screens aren't healthy, if they're not loving, if they're not life-giving, doesn't it make sense just to turn them off? Toss them out? Cancel the Wi-Fi? Get rid of cable? I know, I know. Getting rid of your smartphone sounds like cutting off your right hand. But if that's the cost of living a holy life that brings life to the people around you, isn't it worth the cost rather than going down into those dirty, ugly, horrible places? If that's what it takes to live as God's holy and dearly loved child, isn't it worth it? I mean, you, we can live without red wine. We can live without screens. We can live even without our right hand or our right eye. Persisting in disobedience to God's law, though, that brings death. And Jesus has already suffered death on our behalf for the sins that we've committed. He's gone to hell for us. He's fulfilled righteousness and then attributes it to you so that you are holy in the sight of God. And the Holy Spirit has come to you so that you can live out that holiness already now. And so Jesus' prescription for giving up, hard, uh, giving up hurtful stuff, it might cut us deeply. But it's a healing kind of hurt. God, by His Word, by His Spirit, cuts away the stuff that's unhealthy so that you can live so that you can thrive, so that you can flourish and give life to other people. That's what it means to live as a follower of Jesus Christ, to live as a dearly loved child that God has made holy and righteous without stain or blemish.